Turn to John chapter 11. As as I said, I I got out of the um, sling this week, and I wasn't supposed to until next week. But the the reason I got out was kind of a a, a difficult thing. This has been a a great week, but also kind of a tough week. The incision where they did the surgery got infected. And uh, so I've been waking up in the middle of the night in like a pool of sweat and it's hard to go back to sleep because the sheets are wet, you know, and, and you lay down a towel. And so, and then with the infection, I felt like I had a virus or something just all over my body. And that's why the surgeon, when I went on Thursday, and I wasn't supposed to go till next Tuesday, he said, you know, because you have the infection, I'm going to reward you, let you out of the sling four days early. So I'm grateful for that. But I'm saying all that to explain to you, you don't have any sermon notes in your bulletin today. The reason you don't is because I didn't feel like doing it, all right? <laughs> <laughs> I just felt horrible, and uh, I just couldn't get it done in time. And uh, actually, the route I was going, the Lord changed and gave me this message Friday morning. And so uh, I, I feel like, though, you're, it's uh, going to minister just like last week. I know last week it was like a special message. Someone said to me, man, that was a powerful message. I said, yes, it was, wasn't it? Because, you know, it sh- shocks me too, you know, so... Um, I think the same thing. I'm going to share with you a truth today that I think is going to help you tremendously. And here's the title of the message. You're going to have to take notes a little more than normal today because there's just a blank page in front of you. Here's the title, Because I Love You. Because I Love You. And this is as if God is speaking, answering some questions that we're going to ask him today. Because I love you, all right? All right, John chapter 11. This is the story of Lazarus. Look at verse 1. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, now watch watch carefully here. Verse 3. Therefore the sister sent to him, in other words, sent a messenger to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Kind of like, in case you've forgotten, you really like Lazarus. We want to remind you that you love him. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Verse 5 is a strange verse, but we need it to understand verse 6 clearly in the principle we're going to talk about today. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. It, it, goes, it makes a point of telling us he loved them. So, look at verse 6. So, since he loved them, when he heard that he was sick, he rushed over as quickly as he could. Doesn't that seem like that's what it ought to say because of the word so? He stayed two more days in the place where he was. This makes no sense. Absolutely no sense. As a matter of fact, it would make more sense if it said he loved them, but when he heard he was sick, he had to stay two more days. But it says he loved them, so he stayed two more days. Makes no sense. There are two conversations going on all through John 11. Uh, What I would like for you to do, get in the habit of going back over the message during the week in your quiet time and letting God show you some more things. If you read the whole chapter of John 11, you'll see two conversations going on through the whole chapter, an earthly conversation and a heavenly conversation. Everything that any person, any human being says other than Jesus in John 11 is an earthly conversation. And, And just notice how earthly it is. Everything Jesus says is a heavenly conversation, and the only way to understand it is with spiritual eyes and spiritual ears. Everything he says. Let me just give you an example of that. If you look down just a little bit at verse 11, it says these things he said. If you look at what he said right before that, it's a heavenly conversation, and you can't understand it except through spiritual eyes. These things he said, now watch this, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. That's a spiritual way of referring to death. See what I'm saying? Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. That's a spiritual way of saying, raise the sucker from the dead. Okay? Then his disciples said, now watch the earthly conversation again. Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. 
However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Idiots. <laughs> and I know he didn't say that, but I just, there are all these times when it says, then Jesus said to them plainly. Then Jesus said to them plainly. Why? Because they were always in the earthly conversation. He was in the heavenly conversation. Verse 15, he says, and I'm glad for your sakes, the 12 guys that I'm leaving the project of the evangelization of the world to, <laughs> I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. All right. Notice the two conversations, earthly and heavenly. Is it possible there are two conversations going on in your life right now? Is it possible that with every circumstance and every situation you go through, you're looking at it with earthly eyes instead of heavenly eyes? And is it possible that if we get in the word and really allow God to speak to us, we might see our circumstances differently Instead of seeing death, we might see sleep. You see what I'm saying? And instead of seeing Jesus doing a delay, we might see Jesus doing something that brings great glory to God. Uh, think again now, it says, so he stayed two days. Now, when they got there, by the way, he'd been dead four days. Let me explain that to you. It was a day's journey from Bethany to where Jesus was at this time. So when the messenger left to come talk to Jesus... Lazarus died. As soon as the messenger left, probably shortly after he left, he died. And so here he goes to meet Jesus. So it takes a day's journey for him to get there. Guess what? Jesus knew he was dead. He already knew he was dead. And then Jesus waits two days. And then it takes Jesus a day's journey to get there. So that's why Lazarus was in the tomb four days, in the grave four days. Okay. Why would he do that? When Mary, Martha, and Lazarus got to heaven... There might have been a conversation like this. Hey, Jesus, good to see you again. Appreciated being, getting to know you on earth. But when we got up here, we spoke with John. And he told us that when the messenger came, you waited two days. Now, no hard feelings because it all turned out okay. <laughs> but we just thought we would ask you about that. Why did you wait two days? This would have been Jesus' answer. Because I love you. Now, I'm going to give you a theological truth today that will change your life. Everything God does is because he loves you. Everything. Not one thing he does, even his justice, is rooted in his love. Everything he does is because he loves you. Because I love you. And I'm going to tell you something that maybe you never thought about. Jesus did something for Lazarus that he didn't do for any other human being that has ever lived on the earth or ever will live. Now you just think about it for a minute because you're probably not following me yet. Jesus did something for Lazarus he didn't do for any other human. You say, well, pastor, you're probably wrong about this one. Because yes, he raised him from the dead, but he raised some other people from the dead. Uh-huh. Not after four days. Everyone he raised from the dead, by the way, was on the day they died. See, it was Jewish custom for you to be buried on the day you died. That's why Lazarus was in the tomb four days. The day he died, they buried him. Uh, Jesus was buried on the day he died. They didn't even have time to do the spices correctly. That's why they came back on the Sabbath to do the spices. Because they didn't have time to before the Sabbath. They came back after the Sabbath, I mean, to do that. Uh, the, the widow's son that he raised in the funeral procession, he raised him in the funeral procession. That's on the day he died. He hadn't been buried yet. The uh, little girl that he raised, she was still in the room where she'd been sick. He was on his way to heal her. They brought message and said, don't, don't come. She died. He said, it's okay. And he still went. On the day she died, he raised her. Lazarus is the only one he raised after four days. And by the way, he didn't even do that for himself. He raised himself on the third day, and there's a good reason for that, by the way, because on the fourth day, corruption sets in. Putrefication sets in. If you go to the old King James, Martha put it this way. Jesus said, roll away the stone. And Martha said, behold, he stinketh. <laughs> <laughs> the reason Jesus was raised on the third day 
was because the Bible says you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. But Jesus took Lazarus all the way to the door of corruption and then raised him. You want to know why? Because he is his friend. He knew he was going to raise him from the dead. If, if when the messenger got there, he'd already been dead a day. If he'd have left immediately, he'd have been dead two days, and he would have raised him two, uh, two days after he was dead, but not three. You know what he said? I'm going to do something for you I'm not even going to do for myself. I'm going to let you go four days because I love you. I, I, I want you to understand that is the answer to some difficult questions. Why are you doing this? Because I love you. All right, we're going to ask God some tough questions today, okay? Here's the number one question we're asking you. Again, you've got to write these down because they're not already in your notes. Number one, why did you create pain? Why did you create pain? I've been thinking about this for seven weeks now. <laughs> this is a good question. Why did you, question, why did you create pain? Answer, because I love you. It's true. Did you know why God created pain? God created pain so we wouldn't hurt ourselves more. That's why. When we, when we have pain, it tells us if you don't stop doing this, you're going to hurt yourself more. Uh, Dr. Paul Brand, very well-known and famous physician, worked his entire life with lepers. Worked in the 60s and 70s, lived 20 years in a leprosorium in India. Dr. Brand discovered something that no physician has ever discovered about leprosy in thousands of years of the disease. Thousands of years, every physician believed that there was something in the disease of leprosy that caused the appendages to begin to be eaten away, the flesh and the bone, to where lepers would eventually just lose an appendage. It's not what happens. It's not the disease at all. What leprosy does is it causes the nerves to be eaten away so that the leper can't feel pain. And because the leper can't feel pain, he might be using a hoe and, and using the hoe like this, and there'd be a nail in the handle, and every time he's doing it, he's just slicing his hand up. And then the, the wounds that the lepers would cause themselves on their feet and on their hands because they couldn't feel pain would get infected and the infection would eat away at the flesh. Dr. Brand discovered this in the 70s. No other physician's ever known this. And then they did all these experiments to prove it and to back it up. There, there was a, a young boy that uh, was, uh, there was, Dr. Brand was trying to open a rusted padlock. And the little 12-year-old little boy came by, and he said, let me do that. Just turn the key just like that. Immediately, Dr. Brand knew what happened, grabbed his hand, and noticed he'd sliced his finger all the way to the bone. But the boy didn't know it. They, uh, they got into their research, and then they kind of had a little bit of a, uh, uh, it looked like a, a setback, because these lepers would go to sleep at night, and uh, they'd wake up in the morning missing a finger. And they say, well, it must be the disease eating it away. And that's what people thought for years because they'd, wake up, they'd go to sleep and wake up and have more of the finger gone. And so they did surveillance and found out that what was happening was that rats were coming in at night and eating their appendages. And because they could not feel pain, they couldn't feel it. And, of course, uh, they, did, they thought, well, what do we do about this? And so Dr. Brand prayed, and God gave him the solution, something God created a long time ago. They gave every leper a cat. <laughs> It's the only thing cats are good for. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> anyway, and that took away care of the rats. <laughs> there was an NBA player a few years ago, some of you might remember this, that sprained his ankle before the championship game. So he shot his ankle. They had the doctor shoot his ankle with all these painkillers so he could play in the championship game. In the second quarter, he came down after shooting a, a basket and fell in, on his ankle and broke his ankle. But he couldn't feel it. So he ran up and down the court two more times and did permanent damage and had to retire from the NBA, never to play again. Why? Because the pain was trying to tell him something. The pain was trying to tell him, don't do that anymore. I was sharing with the uh, physical therapist this week about this. It's in a book, by the way, it's uh, by Philip Yancey. It's called, Where is God When It Hurts? Philip Yancey is a very good author, by the way. He wrote, What's So Amazing About Grace? The Jesus I Never Knew. And um, uh, so this book is called, Where is God When It Hurts? That's the book that I've been reading lately. <laughs> and so I'm sharing with this physical therapist about how God gave us nerves and senses to be able to feel so that when we feel pain, it means don't keep doing it. Don't, don't do this anymore. 
And uh, so I'm sharing with her, and I said, I believe God's trying to talk to us when we, when we feel pain. And, and, uh, and about that time, she was stretching my arm, and I said to her, I think God's trying to tell you something right now. <laughs> I, I got a, a headache one day after reading this book and realizing this. I was just, I just all of a sudden, I, I started getting this headache, and I'm on my way to take some aspirin. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, what's my body trying to tell me? What is my body trying to tell me? And, and, and immediately I thought I didn't get much sleep last night. And so I went and I laid down for about 15, 20 minutes. The headache went away. See, here, here's what Dr. Brand says. He says that uh, they, they tried to develop gloves because they lost senses in their fingers. So they didn't know when they were hurting themselves or cutting themselves. So they tried to develop gloves that would tell them when they were holding something too tightly or if something was sticking them so they would know it. Or if something was chewing on them, they would know it. And so they developed these gloves so that if they were holding something too tightly, an alarm would go off. Well, what happened was that the lepers, because they wanted to go ahead and finish the project, they would just keep on working despite the alarm going off. So then they decided, I guess God was right, pain is the only way to get through, get you to stop doing something. So the lepers have senses still on the back of their neck. That's probably the last place to go where they would lose their nervous system. And so they would put electrodes to uh, shock them when they would work. And uh, eventually, though, they would just keep working because the electricity wasn't enough. So then they turned the electricity up to try to get them again to stop hurting themselves. And you know what they did? They would turn it off. So then they rigged it up where they couldn't turn it off, and they'd unplug it. They'd pull it off then. Here's what Dr. Brand's conclusion was. God rigged it where we couldn't turn it off. But here's the sad fact about our society today. We have medicine to turn it off. So that we don't listen when our body's trying to tell us you need to stop doing this because you're hurting yourself. So when you come to this, here's an incredible question. Why did you create pain, God? Because I love you. Because if you don't have pain, did you know that the suicide rate was astronomically higher among these lepers than any other people in the world? You want to know why? Because if you can't sense pain, you can't sense pleasure. They never could feel if anyone hugged them. They couldn't feel it if someone shook their hand. They couldn't feel it if they got a pat on the back. And they felt so isolated from the human race that they killed themselves. Because God created our bodies so wonderfully that we could sense pleasure and we could even sense pain so that we could stop doing what we're doing and not hurt ourselves. So that's question number one. Here's question number two. Why did you create suffering? Why did you create suffering? Now I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here. You know what the answer to this question is? God, why did you create suffering? Answer, I didn't. I didn't. Listen to me carefully. Suffering came in the world when sin came in the world. Sickness came in the world when sin came in the world. Disease and poverty and famine and pestilence and war came in violence came in the world when sin came in the world. God created a perfect world. God created a perfect world. And sin came in the world. We sinned and we destroyed it. You know what some people have said? Some atheists have used this argument. Hey, look around at the ills of society and, and tell me, is there, did God do this? Did God create this? And then they'll say something like this. Is this the best he can do? No, this isn't the best he can do. This is the best we can do. <laughs> No, you want to see the best God can do, listen to the series that Pastor Brady just preached on heaven and study it for yourself. God created a perfect world and gave it to us. And the ills of society are because of sin, not because of God. It's not God's design for babies to go hungry in Africa. It's not the world God designed. Now I'm going to say something tongue-in-cheek. Okay, if God, and he didn't, let me say that, but if God made a mistake, it was giving us a free will and giving us dominion over the world. The world we're living in is because of us, not because of God. And by the way, you say, well, you're saying that all the bad things are because of us? Yep, so are all the good things. <laughs> You know, when we, when we send missionaries around the world and when we do build an orphanage in another country and when we do send money to feed a child in Africa, 
we're changing the world. We're doing something good. That's why the body of Christ has to take its responsibility and take on the ills of society to try to help society. And not only helps to the ills of society, but preach Jesus to them so that when they do pass away from this earth, they live forever in the perfect world that God's created. So I just want you to understand that sometimes I think God's getting blamed for some things that he didn't do. I think he's getting falsely accused. And here's the third question I want to ask. We talked about why did you create pain? Why did you create suffering? Here's a very important question, number three. Why did you suffer? If God didn't create suffering, when Jesus came to this earth, he suffered. He had pain. Why did you suffer? This is the greatest truth I know. I can't tell you a greater, greater truth than this. The creator became the creation. And he did not exempt himself from suffering. When the creator became the creation, he did not exempt himself from pain and suffering. Jesus suffered. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. The creator of the universe became a human being not a superman he could be hurt he could be touched by pain we have the shortest verse in the bible in john 11 john 11 35 jesus wept he was touched by sorrow 
He knows what it's like to be 10 years old. He knows what it's like to be 21 years old. He knows what it's like to lose a friend. And he even knows what it's like to lose a father. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Joseph died when he was a teenager. And God could have chosen any man to be a father for his son and decided to choose a man that would die when his son was a teenager. So that we are the only religion in the world that can truly say, our God knows how we feel. It's the, it's the theological truth called identification. If you don't know what it's called theologically, identification. Here's the amazing thing. Politics has tried to steal this theological truth. And, and they want a politician to, uh, uh, they have a whole strategy called identification. Let me, it goes something like this. The politician flies in on a private jet, gets in a limousine, uh, in the limousine, he changes into some coveralls, and he goes out to some, meet with some farmers, and he stands beside a tractor, and uh, he says, my great-great-granddaddy was a farmer, so I know how you feel. I don't understand that personally, because he never turned the earth, but he knows because his great-granddaddy was a farmer. On the way back into town, he changes again in the limousine to a white coat and a hard hat. He stops by a construction site, and he says, my great-granddaddy's uncle's brother was a construction worker, so I know how you feel. And then he gets back to the limousine, and he puts on a suit, and he goes and meets with bankers, and he says, my great-granddaddy's mother's uncle's brother's sister's friend was a banker, so I know how you feel. He's a liar. He doesn't know how you feel. Let me tell you someone who does. Jesus. Because Jesus said to you, I was a human. I was a human. I felt every whip of the scourge. I felt every nail. I suffered and I died. When I was hungry, I knew pain. When I was thirsty, I knew sorrow. I know. I've been there. I know what you're going through. He didn't exempt himself from it. Let me show you. Sometimes we blame things on God, such as suffering. John eleven twenty one. 21, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 32, then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Isn't it interesting they use the exact same words as if they'd been talking about it for four days. If he'd been here, if he'd been here, I wonder how many times we say, Lord, if you, Lord, if you, and this wouldn't have happened, well, can I tell you something? I've given you two answers today that will answer every question you want to ask God that begins with why. Listen to me carefully. You've got to understand this because I'm telling you, sometimes God's getting blamed for things he's not doing. Well, sometimes the answer is, I didn't. And then if he did it, the answer is, because I love you. You've got to remember these two things. I didn't because I love you. I didn't because I love you. God, why did you do this bad thing to me? I didn't. God, why did you do this good thing for me? Because I love you. Here's another good question. God, why are you turning things that the devil means for evil for my good? Because I love you. Why are you causing all things to work together for my good? Because I love you. And when it says turning things that are evil for our good, that means that there are things that are evil. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. Why, God, did you do this? I didn't. You're blaming me. I didn't do that. Well, why did you do this? Because I love you. This past week, a pastor friend called me. And I told you I was having a tough week with the infection and all. It just felt horrible. But on top of that, there was a spiritual attack coming against me this past week. And this pastor friend of mine called me on Wednesday night. And he said, Robert, I just feel like I'm supposed to tell you this story. <clears throat> he said, um... Fifteen years ago at his church, there was a rebellion going on. There's nothing like that going on here at Gateway. And he said there was a rebellion going on. There were three to four hundred people in the church that were trying to get me to leave the church. And they were spreading rumors about me and 
gossip and they were making every, every meeting hard and some of the men were in his leadership and they were always trying to accuse him of things and come against him. And he said it was just one of the worst seasons of our life. And then he said, on top of that, my mother tried to commit suicide. And he said, actually, she did commit suicide and they resuscitated her. And then, two weeks after my mother committed suicide, my wife, after a church service on a Sunday, said, I just can't take it anymore. You can imagine in a church of maybe 1,500 at the time, three, 12 to 1,500 to have three to 400 people try and cause problems, how it would affect the services, not like the spirit of God that we sense this morning, the love and the unity in here, but the anger and the bitterness and the hatred that you sense sometimes in a church fight like that. So his wife after church said, I just can't take it anymore. I just got to drive around and pray. I just have to pray. I, have to just, I want to be alone. I just want to drive around and pray. She got in her car and she started driving around and she came through an intersection and an 18-wheeler ran a light and hit her broadside. He goes to the hospital and his wife has multiple broken bones. Doing, just doing bad. He doesn't know what about the, the internal problems she has. Two weeks earlier when he walked into the uh, hospital room where his mother had tried to commit suicide, the doctor that was treating his mother was one of the men that was rebelling in the church. And he said, he looked at me like, this is your fault. Because you won't leave the church like you should. This is your fault. All these things are happening because of you. He said when he walked into the emergency room to see his wife, there was a different doctor there, but it was another doctor part of the uh, rebellious group. He said again, he looked at me kind of like, now do you get, now you're getting the message? Now you're getting the message? You're out of God's will? You ever, you ever had the devil tell you stuff like that? Everything bad happens to you, it's your fault. And so he walked outside and he said, God, are you trying to tell me something? And he said, just like that, the Lord said, yes. And he said, well, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? This is what he said. He said, I'm trying to tell you how much I love you. No matter what you're going through right now, I know this is a tough time, but I want you to know that I love you. He said, within well, just about a month, this rebellious group of people left the church and this, the spirit, the peaceful spirit came back in the church. He said his wife miraculously got better. He led his mother to the Lord. She was not even a believer. He led his mother to the Lord. Then he led his father to the Lord. He said the body gathered around them and told them, you are a great pastor. We love you. We, and they gathered around and they sent cards and they prayed for him and they brought meals into his home and they just gathered around him and they gathered around his parents. His parents were welcomed into the church and he said his parents were so excited. They never sensed love like this. Never been loved like this before. They were so excited about church. They would sit in the church parking lot an hour and a half before church began just waiting for the church service. And he said, Robert, I sense the love of God through one of the worst times of my life more than ever. And then he said to me, he said, I just want you to know something. God just tried to tell you something right.
trying to tell you how much he loves you and I want you to know because you're going through things we all go through things and no matter what you're going through right now I want you to understand something first of all he didn't (laughs) he didn't he didn't do it second of all he loves you and if you will press into God and press into the body he will tell you he loves you I woke up one morning last week feeling absolutely horrible and I had this old song from Hee Haw (laughs) going through my mind gloom despair and agony on me if it weren't for bad luck I'd have no luck at all I mean you know you have this deal and then you get an infection you know it just and then all the other stuff's going on. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I need a different song for today <laughs> to go through my mind. And I said, would you give me a song? And I mean, I heard the Lord so clearly say yes. And immediately, this is a song that came to me. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you through this message? What are you going through right now that you don't need to blame God for? And what are you going through right now that you need to press in to God and to the body of Christ so that you can know and sense and feel the love of Jesus? We want to pray for you. If you're going through a difficulty right now, we want to pray for you. Don't ever come to church with a burden and leave with a burden. Give that burden to God in worship. Give it to God sometime in the message. Give it to God at the altar with someone as a prayer partner at the end of the service. But don't take it with you. Give it to God. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, we'll stand and we'll have one more worship song. When we stand, if you're going through a difficulty, come on down. Let us pray for you. Don't don't let the devil tell you, oh, you've done that before. It won't change anything. Prayer does change things. If you're going through a difficulty, if you're here today and you don't know if you died, you'd go to heaven. If you're here today and you feel like you're the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter and you're away from God, come home to God today. This is your chance. You won't be the only one that's coming. There will be a lot of people coming to the altar. So if you need prayer for any reason at all, as soon as we stand up, you just stand up and you step out and come and let us pray for you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw every person that has any prayer need in Jesus' name. Amen.